a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. Another edition of Amazing Arizonans and truly one of my favorite people. The biggest question I get asked when they find out where I work is, what's Ron Wolfley like? <laughs> well, we're about to find out. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely, bro. My, I get my asked honor. all the time. All the time. Okay, I, I don't understand that. I, I think there's a lot of people who, who they, they hear my voice, and first of all, the number one response I get, Brew, from people is, man, I thought you were 6'5 and had a beard. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the first thing they think of. Yeah. Number two, they're, they're like, do you talk like that all the time? <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> yes, yeah. this is my voice. It's the only one that I have. There are many times, too, that people will come up to me, especially women, and just go, oh, Mr. Wolfley. I love the things that you say. I just can't stand how you say it. You know what I, I mean? get that reaction from women too, Seriously? by the way. As well, yeah, but it's a, for a whole different Man. set of reasons. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, yeah. It's, I had listen, a, I got hit in the throat yeah. as a player playing Penn State, as a matter of fact. It happened to be in college. I was blocking this guy and I was doing a good job. I got it. Oh, I got into him really, really hard. Sorry about that, fast. And all of a sudden, um, the guy swung around because the the ball went by him he swung around and turned his back to me and as he swung around it hit me right in the throat i spit up blood for like three days Whoa. after that and i think that's one of the reasons why especially as as i've aged one of the reasons why my voice is like this but it's a great voice I got. I got. Asked. I can't stand it. I turn it when I hear it. Really? I do. Yeah, I do. I don't. Honestly. I don't like my voice either. Okay. Um, I met a listener, an older, very, a much older woman, at an event maybe ten years ago. Yeah. And she wanted to meet me, so she came up with her. Now her daughter brought her over. Her daughter was in her sixties. Okay. And she, the this very nice woman, comes up, and I met her and said hello to her, and she said, "You sound taller." <laughs> <laughs> So I just was taking it like she was complimenting my big sounding voice. <laughs> That's good. So um, I want to I want to talk about everything. There's so much I want to talk to you about. Okay. Um, I want to start with your playing career uh, because a uh, Buffalo, New York kid. Yeah. Went to West Virginia. Um, matter of fact, you were a trivia question. I think on Monday Night Football this year. Was it Thursday yes, night football it was or Monday Thursday night? night Thursday night, night football. Yeah, I think it was. You Thursday were the answer night. to a trivia question. That's right, Aflac. Yeah, and you. Um, and that's not payola. <laughs> that, that's right. You, it could be. <laughs> Just it saying, it's be. not. <laughs> and but you also are the only player to play for the St. Louis Cardinals and the Arizona Cardinals, right? That's, that's right. Because you were with them when they made the move. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm the only player actually to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. And the St. Louis Rams. Oh, the Rams. Okay. The Rams. The okay. St. Louis Rams. Okay. Because I went and I played there in 1995. I went back and played with the St. Louis Rams, which is really interesting because, as you know, um, the St. Louis Cardinals, for the most part, I played three years in St. Louis. Love St. Louis. What a great town it was. But, man, people pushed us out of the city for the most part, yeah. right? They they were, okay, Go. We'll get another team here at some point in time. So they pushed us out, and then all of a sudden I came back with the St. Louis Rams, their inaugural season in St. Louis. So now we we were welcomed as conquering yeah. heroes. Yeah. So I saw both ends of that stick, interestingly enough. But, yeah, the only guy to play for both St. Louis franchises. Okay, I got it wrong. Who wants to be yeah. a millionaire? Yeah. That, Final answer. Yeah. There you go. I have to remember that one for our for trivial right. pursuit. That's right. Uh, so let's talk about your toughness because you were known <laughs> as a really tough player. You were the wedge buster, special teams, pro bowler. How many years in the pro bowl? Four. Four. Four pro bowls. Yeah, I played 10 years overall, four pro bowls, team captain eight of the 10 years that I played. And I don't think I should have been in the NFL for 10 days. <laughs> that's That's – it was just – Thank you, Lord God, um, for what he did for me because, um, you know, I was a guy that tried hard, Brew. Yeah. I tried really, really hard, and um, I loved it, and I love the game because this game will embrace you. It, it will love you like, like a newborn and a mother. It will hold you and embrace you if you will just give her everything you got. The game of football loves the wretched, loves the downtrodden. 
That's what loves you, the hungry. Do you gravitate towards those kind of players yes. now in your career? Yes, I do, bro. Because I I, I empathize. Obviously, um, I can relate to these guys that go out and try hard. Now, again, you've got to have a, a modicum of talent. You have to have some talent, um, you know, but. Man, toughness matters, or it did in the National Football League in 1985. Yeah. Well, you look at a guy like an Edelman. Oh, yeah. Not not a big guy. Nope. But not just turned himself into an NFL player, but turned himself into an NFL star. <sighs> just incredible. Listen you know. to coaching. Yes. Very disciplined. Um, hooked himself right next to Tom Brady, followed him around in the offseason, made yep. sure he was available to run routes, did all of that extra stuff to make the team. And off he went. There are, are very few sports, um, team sports in particular, where if you just try harder, you'll do better. Yeah. Football, one of them. Try harder. You'll do better. Do you, when you, so I want to, I don't want to jump ahead too much. Did that toughness come from your youth? I mean, growing up where you did, you know, it's a working class area. Was it that kind of a thing for you? Was yeah. Yeah. Following in your brother's footsteps. Yeah, no doubt about it. My older brother, Craig, played 12 years in the National Football League. He was five years older than I was. So, you know, he influenced me. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I, I I don't know exactly where it came. I wasn't the toughest individual in high school. I, I you know, now listen, I, I was a kid that grew up and I had the wrong clothes on and uh, we were poor in a rich town, and when you're poor in a rich town, you're not going to have the right corduroys, you're not going to have the right jeans, you're not going to have the right shirt, and suddenly people are going to start mocking you because of it. And I was one of these kids growing up where, you know, I, I took it and I took it and then I didn't take it. <laughs> yeah. And then it stopped, and, um, you know, it just was a situation where – um at some point in time, I, I learned that um, football would reward me if I just um, took that mentality on the field. And I, I will tell you this right now. I got a scholarship to go play at West by God, Virginia. Yeah. Okay, West Virginia University. It's West Virginia. It's West Virginia, the pride of every mountaineer. <laughs> um, I went there, and when I showed up my freshman year, I I was not the toughest guy on the – I was not. And um, I can tell you, Brew, on day number three, they moved me to fullback. I was 198 pounds. Oh, my God. And they moved me to fullback in an era where every fullback was 250 plus. 250 pounds plus yeah. to play fullback. I was 198 pounds. They moved me to fullback day three because they had three kids that they had recruited from Florida that were running four threes at running back. I was I was not a, a guy that was running a four three. I was running a four six at that point in time. So they said, you know what? You get down in a three point stance. We'll give the ball to the guy behind you, and you go block somebody. Day three of my college career. Can I also say um, that was my freshman year. Going into my freshman year, spring, okay, the same year, my first year of college football in the spring, where you had 20 practices, a t-shirt that said, I hit for 20. I hit for 20. Meaning you were all, you were there for all 20 practices. And it was very physical. Everything you did, Brew, was was a hit live situation. Yeah. Everything you did, individual, group period, team period, everything was live. It was a brutal slugfest, metaphorically speaking, for the most part. And I remember going out there, and um, my dad was home in Orchard Park, New York, in the spring of my freshman year, and he was dying of leukemia. Oh. He was dying, and I knew he was dying. And yet, I went out there at 198 pounds in the spring, and I, I, I wanted to take all of that hurt, all of that pain, everything that I was feeling inside me for my dad, and transfer it on somebody else. And, Brew, 
That's how I learned to play football. That's how I learned to play like I would for the rest of my career because my dad was dying at home in a hospital bed in our living room at 45 Hudson Road in Orchard Park, New York. And I went out there and I ran into guys full speed. I didn't care what happened to me because I knew, bro, whatever was going to happen to me, it's nothing like what my dad was going through. So you follow in your brother's footsteps. I want to ask about this because now we're going to get to your com- your career in broadcasting. But okay. do you see a similarity when you look at the Kelsey brothers? When you see Jason Kelsey, his younger brother, Travis Kelsey, both of them very, very successful at what they do, two completely different people. But do you look at that and see how that older, younger brother relationship works with oh, them? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I don't know about their relationship. But I know how Craig, my older brother, impacted me. Um, You know, once again, uh, to be sitting there watching my brother was five years older than I was. He was 13 years old. And to watch him work out in, in our garage in the middle of January in Buffalo, New York, back when the temperatures were below zero. And he was out there working out in the weight room that he had created out there. I'll never forget um, his work ethic and the way that he's impacted me throughout my life. He's been such a great example to me of what a young man should be, what a man should be, what a football player should be, what a man of God should be. Um, He's always been that example for me, the best example that a little brother or that a big brother could be to a little brother. When you think about that relationship, because I'm on the other side of it, I'm the oldest. Okay. I'm the older brother. Yeah. So when I look at my my brother Tom, who was killed in Iraq, and and I think about the sacrifice he made, and and I was just so proud of how he did what he did. Um, the story is is truly a heroic story, and you're so proud of. And even I wonder in those moments if there that moment came to me. Would I handle it as heroically as he did? Yeah. My youngest brother, has, even though he was the youngest, has always been my hero. I mean, he just did things the right way. First one in our family to graduate from college. And he's a great father and a great husband and a great cop. And I just admire him so much. So I see that from the older brother's point of view. Yes. For you to look at your older brother, did you try to emulate him? Or for, like my brothers, we were different. Yeah. My brother wanted, my brother Tom didn't want anything to buy. He didn't want to be like <laughs> me at all. Yeah, it's interesting, Brew, because um, my older brother Craig is different from me. There's no denying it. Um, he's a guy that has a long fuse. But when the fuse goes off, run. Yeah. (laughs) Run. When it goes off, it's going to go. I mean, you're talking about a guy, my older brother Craig, who competed in not one, but two World Strongman contests. I didn't know that. Two, yes. I didn't know that. He finished fifth, as a matter of fact. Two World Strongman contests back when ESPN used to do this all the time and air this. This is a guy that owned and operated his own full contact martial arts center for 20 years. He taught people how to be an ultimate fighter before it actually became very popular. Yeah. He was on the mat choking out guys after he played 12 years in the NFL. He was one of the most lethal human beings on the face of the planet. And all Craig did was walk around and love people, Mm -hmm. hug people and good love people in the name of God. And this was the example that he was to me as I was growing up. I had a boom, mushroom cloud, short fuse that would go off and go, and it still to this day goes off. But thank the Lord, um, I've got that to a point where um, it's under control. And I'm not proud of it at all. Yeah, my uh, mine is uh, road rage. Okay. Mine is road rage, and I have. A, I think I try to be. I'm. I try to be fairly easygoing. Yeah. But I. I'm not proud of that part of me either. That fuse that goes off. Yeah, I know. But it's, I don't see pride. that. But see, I don't see that in you, which is I think. Yeah. A, I mean, as a compliment. Yeah. No. I. 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 I appreciate that, bro. It. Listen. Um. Once again, it rarely happens to me anymore. But I know. Look, um, 
my adversary, who is the devil, I'm just telling you right now, this is my belief, and I believe it with everything that I have. My adversary attacks me, (sighs) makes me feel like that kid growing up in that rich town, a poor kid (laughs) growing up in that rich town. You're not good enough. Mm -hmm. That's where my own pride starts welling up. When I get in trouble, that's what it is, bro. Same with me. Just telling you right now, it is that. And and I know it, and because I know it, um, I can deal with it through God. I think we had similar childhoods in that regard: the tough yeah. skin jeans and yeah. the track shoes yep. Yep. from Kmart. Yep, and uh, didn't have you're much. You're not good enough, right? Yes, that feeling. You're a poor kid, and you're. Yeah. Not. It's one of the great things about the game of football. When I had the epiphany that I could step in between those white lines. And it didn't matter how None much of money. It, mattered. it didn't matter how much money your dad made or didn't make. Everything was fair. <laughs> oh my goodness! That to me, I loved that paradigm, and I, I, I'll never forget that when I was 13 years old, and I came to the realization that oh wait a minute, this levels everything. That was really cool. It's the It's back to talking about the game that we both love so much. It is the idea. For me, it was growing up in the South because I was born in Cleveland. So we used to get those horrible storms you'd get in Buffalo and they'd come down and hammer Cleveland. Oh, yeah. But I grew up in Southwest Florida. And so growing up in the South in the 70s, there were still racial relations weren't what they were desegregating schools. But not on the fields. Not when you were on the football field, not when you were on the baseball field. When you were on the field, it didn't matter about your home life. All that mattered is can you help the team win? And if you can help the team win, you played. Isn't that great? Um, The greatest thing about uh, a locker room, especially to me growing up in this environment, um, the NFL locker room, uh, growing up there, we used to say there's only one color in here, and it's red, the color of blood. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> because I, well, I, I was wearing your blood. I, you, we were yeah. wearing each other's blood on our pants, on our you know arms, wristbands, whatever it may be. There's only one color in this locker room. I remember so much of the time. I mean, it was it's one of the best things that ever happened to me as a young man um, was being on this football team and to this day um, realizing that um, we're all the same. The exact same. God's children through and through. And I came to knowledge of that as a very, very young man growing up in a home, of course, that preached that to us daily, that we're all God's creation. When did, um, because I want want to talk about your some more of your playing career, but I I don't want to miss this because when was it for you that your faith clicked where where yeah. living what you believed yeah. meant more than anything else yeah i was 12 years old as a matter of fact really i was 12 i i, I grew up I, I love to say this i grew up in a family uh that we were basically amish but we drove cars <laughs> all right we drove cars and we used electricity but we were we had a mindset of being amish it was so rooted in our faith of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ being Lord and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and growing up in a family where um, our faith was huge on both sides, my dad's side, on my mom's side. Everybody in my family was a Christian. Everybody in my family knew Jesus and had a relationship with him. And it was a, I got to a point where I was 12 years old where I realized it's not going to be my mom's relationship with God. It's not going to be my dad's relationship with God. It's not going to be my siblings. It's not going to be my grandpa and grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins. It's not going to be my family's relationship with God. It's going to be my relationship with Jesus when I was 12 years old. Wow. And that's where it changed my life and where he changed my life. Is it, um, for me, it was later in life. I was raised Catholic, um, could recite the Catholic mass when I was 10 years old. Um, Always a believer in God, believed Jesus, son of man, or son of God, I should say. Um, It wasn't until I was an adult and much older where it impacted me in a way where I knew that I wasn't living what I believed. 
And even now, you, yes. I catch myself so often realizing that I believe so strongly, but I behave in such a weak manner. And that, I think, is the, I'm, that's probably going to be the highest level of maturity I get to when I recognize it in myself. It doesn't have to be pointed out to me all the time. God's not done with you, man. Oof. That's all I'm telling I hope you not. right now. The sanctification process, and you know this, he's not done with you. Progressive bro. sanctification. No, there's no way about it. Yeah. Man. You won't be done until you're with him, yeah. period. Some of the, I, I tell people, um, no, and I, I nor don't. nor will I, for that matter. Right, oh yeah. Nor will I. I, I don't, know, one of the things I can, I've, I, when I get to and I have the privilege of speaking in public, I say to people, no one can rattle my faith because we talk about faith until you have to rely on it. <laughs> When my brother was killed, and I was the officiant at my brother's funeral, but I watched my mother endure that. Yes. There's no way I would be able to get up in front of anybody and speak or do any function in any way if I w there were times when I would get up to speak, when I would say in my mind, I have no idea how to get through this. And it, not only did I get through it, but we did it the right way. So rattling my faith is impossible in the belief that God exists. Yes. But it's the faith in myself to live like it. Apply it. Yeah. Apply That's it. That's the hard what part. You're doing. It is the hard part. You have to start with the little things. You know, I remind myself of this all the time. Start with the little things. Apply your faith to the little things in life. And all of a sudden you, you apply it to the bigger things and the bigger. And the, before you know it, in life and death situations, your faith is going to make you strong as whole. Jesus said that he was the, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one came to the Father except through him. The life, I love that right there too, because he's talking about not just life eternal, which is not just life eternal. It's, it's to me, what an unbelievable possibility that is, and our minds cannot even understand it, but it's life here with him, walking through some of the biggest disasters that you'll you'll face and i have faced in my own life yeah with him did it did it keep you did it ground you in your career because you know with the the status the fame sometimes the money of being an nfl player there are a lot of distractions that are out there yeah. there are a lot of detours that you can take oh, yeah. D did it keep you away from those things Man, it just, it always kept me very, very humble. It's impossible to know God and know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be haughty. Can we be haughty at times? Yeah, we all can from time to time. But to walk around in a state of being haughty, that was never, that was never my problem. I, I knew how lost I was. I knew how wretched I was. I, I knew how... Um, how badly I needed to fall on my faith. I knew all of that. And um, yet at the same time, um, you know, I, it was hard for me to also go out and, and do and live it to a degree where, especially in the world of football, um, where it was such a testosterone-driven um, paradigm Hyper aggressive alpha male sure. paradigm where you were taught to meet force with more force. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it just was a completely different situation. But did I answer your question? Yeah. Or not? I yeah, just, yeah. But it's the, but the other side of it then, because I think maybe we share, I didn't know this about you, but for me, I never felt good enough. That's always been my, I've always struggled with self esteem. So the things we do for a living, I'm very opinionated. That's my job. Yeah. Giving people the impression that you're loaded with self-confidence. I've never have been. There is an element of it, though, that on the other side, one is God keeps you humble. Oh, but on the other goodness. side of it, there's a level of self-confidence that can come with if I'm here because you want me here. Life abundantly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Life abundantly is what it is. Um, you know, when you, you know or believe, as I know, and believe why we're here everything else makes sense yeah even the even the bad things good things 
bad things. Everything makes sense when you know why you're here and what this is all about. And that's Christianity. That's walking with God, walking with a risen Savior. It's it's interesting because I loved my old career. I, li- I liked being an electrician. I was really good at it. This career, I've always felt like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I didn't know anything about broadcasting, didn't know anything about the job, but it felt like this is where I was supposed to be, and that took the pressure off of me. Does that make sense? It took yes. pressure off. Yeah. When you transitioned from the field to the broadcasting booth, was that was that a conscious decision from you? Did you decide you wanted to do that? What what made you do that? You know, it's interesting. What made me do that? My older brother Craig. <laughs> yeah. Like so much, you know. Once again, he was the guy that lowered the plow and hit the gas, metaphorically speaking, in regard to playing the game of football and watching him play the game of football and suddenly getting that college scholarship. Oh my goodness! And then me wanting to follow in his footsteps right there and. You know, it, it was the same thing with Craig and and watching him and um, watching him walk through life and apply his faith to everything that happened in his life as well. And I picked up on that. And um, I can't thank him enough because of that. But, you know, um, man, uh, the, the confidence that comes with that is so settling and beautiful and strong that um, I can't put it into words. When you think about both of your careers, the two, on the playing field, you were a fan favorite as a player. That they Do you lo- know why, though? Do you Be- know why I was a fan Because you were a maniac. Because, because well, it, it, was, it was a little bit of that. I'm not going to say that it wasn't. But it was also, too, I think fans, they looked at me and said, man, if that guy can do it, I could do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? If that guy, because, you know, to them, to them, I may have been the guy sitting next to you at the bar. Right. You know what I mean? They were like, I wasn't huge. I, I was six foot, 222 pounds. That's what I was. And yet, if that guy could do it, maybe I could do it. That's why I think fans took to me. So listen, we all, we've all seen the movie Rudy. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> right. Okay. We've seen, the, we've seen the movie where the kid with not a whole lot of talent makes the team. Yeah. And it's a great story. You didn't just make the team. You were a pro bowler. You showed people that desire <laughs> can take you a lot further than what people believe your skill set is. Yes. Yes. No, it, it's the truth. And um, look, that's the reason why I love football. We were talking about this because if you just try harder, you'll do better in the game. And I'll never forget this. There are two things in the game of football that allow you to be a good football player, allow you to use every bit of God-given talent that you've been given. There are two things. Number one, fearless. You, you have to walk out onto the field and be fearless. And if you are, hey, listen, getting killed, everybody gets killed. Everyone gets gets beat on a play. Everybody does. There's no shame in getting beat. You can't be afraid to get beat. Yet so many people are mm-hmm. in life sure. afraid of getting beat. Be afraid of trying, of not trying. I'm sorry. Yeah. Be afraid of not trying. Be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of getting beat. Um, it's like Grant Hill's mom once said. Don't fear failure, fear success, because success can change you as a person, right? Fearlessness, you got to go out there and do that. If you do that on a football field, and number two, do it every time, every play. Yeah. Be fearless for every play. If, if kids are listening right now, if kids are watching this right now, if you'll just do those two things, Approach whatever it is that you're doing. Hopefully it is for the good, of course. Whatever you're doing, do it fearlessly and do it every day. (laughs) And if you'll do those two things, you will get every bit of God-given talent out of you, no matter what it is you're trying to do. You'll get every bit of God-given talent out of you if you'll do those two things. I will tell you my my biggest regret 
Um, I moved to Arizona in 1995. I love the sport of rodeo. Don't ask me where I got it from. Love I know this about rodeo. you. Yeah. And so I came here in 1992 on vacation, moved here in 1995, and I said, I'm going to learn to ride bulls. I want to be a bull rider. <laughs> and so I started out, and I will tell you that in a span of one year, I had really severe injuries. Broke my ankle bone off twice, broke my foot, broke my shoulder, all in a span of 12 months. And I was so paralyzed with that. You said be fearless. I was terrified. Terrified. So much so, I didn't try. And I ended up quitting. I quit because that's not a sport you can do timidly. <laughs> and I quit. And much older, I left when I was in my early 30s, I quit. And I remember it haunted me to this Did day. It really? Because... I know in my heart of hearts, I didn't try. I know in my heart of hearts, I let fear get the better of me. So I would give the same, and I do give the same advice you give from the opposite side of mm -hmm. don't let this haunt you. Yes. At 56 years old, my days of getting on bulls are over. Yes. But not the memory of I had an opportunity to learn from the best. It's very cool. And I squandered it because I was afraid. Had I had that fearlessness, I know I would have been much better than I, uh, than you I know, was. You know what's really interesting about this topic as well? There, there are those that model this kind of behavior. Um, Buddha Baker. Yeah. Buddha Baker is, uh, I tell kids all the time, wherever I go, watch Buddha Baker play the game of football. Watch him do it. He does two things. He plays it fearlessly on every play. Those two things, fearlessly, on every play. Man, all of that God-given goodness is coming out of Buda Baker when you watch him play the game of football because of those two things. Right. Coaches called it running into the darkness. That's what they called it. Buda Baker plays football running into the darkness. <laughs> Which is a great visual because you know how scary that yeah. is. And yet he does it every play. I know that for me, now in my life, whatever I'm doing now, I take that advice because, and I say, people joke with me about being so busy, and I tell them, I always say yes, because someday they're going to quit asking. Mm -hmm. And you know, when something ends for you, when your football career ended, you know that you're going to miss it to some degree, or you're going to think about it, it's over. You're not, you can't go back. I can't go back. There's going to come a day when this career ends. And I want to be okay with an ending. I want to miss it, but I want to be okay that it's over. I don't want to have squandered opportunities. So maybe this is my second chance in saying I'm not going to say no because someday they're going to quit asking. Yeah, no, that is that is a great way to look at it, no doubt. Um, for me, you know what I love about broadcasting the most is the fact that I can take the headset and I can stick it on, on over my ears and all of a sudden start talking about the game that I love. And as I'm talking about it, bro, I don't look like this anymore. <laughs> I'm not 61. I'm not fat and 61. I'm not. Suddenly when I, when I put the headset on and I start talking into the microphone, I'm 24 again. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember what it was like to be 24 with 8% body fat. I'm gonna drive you into the ground. And by, by the way, I got killed many, many times yeah. thinking that way. I'm going to drive you into the ground and got killed. I want everyone to know that out there. Destroyed. But I had the unmitigated temerity to get up and do it again and again and again. Getting destroyed out of the football field. But the, 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 the mindset, the, the mentality is what I loved. And I love remembering what it was like to do that when I put the headset on and start broadcasting about competition, about athletics, about sports, about football. Have you ever had conversations, and I'm not asking you to tell me who if you have, but if you had a, um, have you had any conversations with an athlete that was underachieving that you told them they need to play fearlessly on every play that they're not giving everything they need to give to the sport yes yes i have i will not say the name Just how was it how was it received um almost every time um with complete appreciation and respect i, I as a teammate 
Um, I was a team captain eight of the ten years that I played. As a teammate, many times, um, teammates would walk up to me and they would challenge me about something that I had to do. And, and I would do the same. Walk up. It, it was one of the great things about being in that paradigm, once again, where you had these men who were leaders and um, we would encourage each other. We would challenge each other by walking up and saying, what are you doing? You're killing us. This isn't you. This isn't the person I, what are you doing? Get it right. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the way that would bring you together. Yeah. Um, the respect. Yeah. That was there, bro. It was for real. I was, uh, I was, a, I had season tickets for the Cardinals for a few years. Great yeah. seats. And so a 50 yard line, you know, just up in the club level. So I got a great view right behind the Cardinals bench. And I was with a friend at the game and we were watching pregame. You know, early, you got there pretty early. And you walked out on the field. You walked onto the sidelines. And there had to be, between the time that I could see you to when you walked to a close to the 50-yard line to talk, I think you were talking to Mr. Bidwill, um, there must have been six fans shouting out to you, wanted to say hello, and you stopped to talk to everybody. Are you surprised by your popularity? Yeah. Are you? Yeah, I am a little bit. Um, I, you know, bro, I'm the son of a truck driver, and I always will be. And I'm so thankful for that mentality. Um, the humility that my king showed um, is something that I want to emulate in my own life as well. Um, I, I feel so ridiculous um, being this kid who grew up at 45 Hudson Road, this dead end street that emptied into a gravel pit. Um, you know, I just don't get it. And, and it but you recognize it exists, right? I, I recognize that it exists. I just um, will never see myself that way, ever. But you have to recognize that you're acknowledging someone makes their day. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've watched them do it. Yeah. And it's, it's something special that I, they're. I know, but I, I don't, I don't think of that. <laughs> I don't think, you know, that I'm going to, I, I think this, this person is, is showing me grace, showing me kindness. I'm going to go over and reciprocate that, you know, and even somebody that's yelling at me, uh, <laughs> somebody that is calling me some bad names um <laughs> i used to have problems with that when i was yeah. younger yeah there's no doubt about it i'm okay with it now i really am i but wish when I, could... I was younger i used to have problems with i have it. a brand new phone if i could find the picture quickly i'd find it but i know i showed it to you um my girls are both in their 30s now but when they were younger my youngest was maybe a freshman in high school 13 14 years old okay she is but even then, but then was such a huge Ron Wolfley fan. <laughs> and this was before we knew each other. And I've got a picture on my phone still of you with her. She was beside herself <laughs> to be able to take a picture with you. Okay. As a player? Was I? Was I no, this was no, post player. This is okay. Yeah. Wow. I see. I, 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 you know, it makes me blush. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what to say. Um, I just don't get it. I, now, this I, is a girl, not a huge sports fan. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but loved Ron Wolfley. Man, you know, I, I, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, I just feel like, you know, love God, love people. That's what I want to do in my life. And um, that's what I'm trying to do. When it comes to this career, the one you're in now, the radio show, which is immensely successful, your broadcasting career with the Cardinals and other NFL games you've done. Are there things you still want to accomplish? Or are there things, I mean, if you think about it, are there things you still want to do? I, I want to be the best I can possibly be for me, for Ron Wolfley, for what God has given me. I want to be the best that I can possibly be. Until somebody taps me on the shoulder and goes, <laughs> "Yeah, it's time for you to stop." Um, that is the way I've always been, bro. And I, I think I've told you this before, but my life is a series of ten by ten rooms with a door on each wall, 
and a chair in the middle of it. And I sit in that chair and I, I just wait on God to open one of the doors in the room. Oh, you want me to go that way? And I get up and I sit down in that 10 by 10 room in the chair and wait for him to open another door. Oh, this is my whole life has been that way. Every time I try to get up and open the door myself, it blows up in my face for whatever reason. It's been the same for so, me. So, okay. So I, I, I kind of feel like I'm just going to keep working until I can't do this anymore and um god i trust to show me when that time is where i can't do this anymore and um when that happens i'll get out of that chair i'll walk through that door and i'll sit right back down in the next chair all right, so I can't let you go without asking you this. And if it's too personal, you can tell me you don't want to talk about it. But the only thing I've ever seen you get as excited about talking about this football is your wife. <laughs> you and I have had, and I've never met, your, queen. I've never met your wife. The warrior queen. So I will tell you the two things that I admire about you. Number one, your career. But um, we, we share a love for angry music. <laughs> we share a love for angry music. Okay, but uh, can I just say about that? I love it because it would get me ready to go play football right. in the tunnel and we're coming out of the tunnel. But it used to have power over me. It's got no power over me. Now. I used to. I just appreciate I, it for what it is. Like a lot of other people, I cannot hear the song Walk by Pantera <laughs> without thinking of you. Are you talking to me? Right. It just, that's you. Yes. That's your song. But yes. the other conversations, when the people that don't get to see us behind the scenes in the. Phil and Selma, yeah. by the way, just want to say. <laughs> and the three minutes we have between com in commercial breaks, we bump into each other. The most animated I've seen you is football. And talking about your wife, who I've never met. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me just a little bit about that? I mean, if, if you're willing, just yeah. because I, I see how animated you get in talking about how strong she is and yes. what she means to you. Yes, um, she is just this beautiful woman. <laughs> all right, first of all, if I do say so myself, just this beautiful woman um, who happens to be so strong um, I've said this many, many times, but you could take Stephanie Rachel Wolfley, my wife, and you could drop her into any paradigm and give her two weeks and she will absorb the paradigm and then regurgitate said paradigm and, and master it. If you just give her a couple of weeks, she's that bright. She's that with it. And, um... I've got such appreciation for that quality in her that I started calling her the warrior queen, the warrior queen, right? Stephanie Rachel, because she is the most capable human being that I know. This is a woman who loves God first and loves people around her, who walks into any room and immediately her smile sets the room on fire. Um... I love and appreciate her so much for being able to look at me and see all my flaws, all my ridiculousness, and yet um, love me still through it all. Uh, it's a beautiful thing, and she's a beautiful woman. And um, I can't thank the Lord God enough for giving her to me. Because if you knew that story, I'll have to come back on that one because that story was crazy. There's a, a pastor friend of mine that always would, would preach and say, it's easy to love the people that are easy to love. There's something special about someone, like you said, that can see yeah. the good oh. and love you through the bad. And I would imagine, because you you and I share a, an intensity in our personalities, yes. <laughs> it takes a very strong person to live with that. <laughs> Am I right? The intensity. Yeah, yeah. I think she would agree with you. Yes. The intensity definitely is there. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do that when you see somebody that is so um, calming and somebody that is willing to see past your faults 
and see you for who you are and what you are and still love you in the process. And it brings your guard down, kind of diffuses that intensity. I got to tell you that you may know this, but um, you're one of the reasons I came to work at this company. I admired you before I really knew you because we had so many mutual friends. Absolutely. And then when I got to meet you, I remember the first time I met you was at your restaurant with a mutual friend of ours. And I got to spend about 20 minutes talking to you. And you know when you get to meet someone that you admire or somebody that you know who they are, you hope they're going to live up to expectations. You're one of the people that has far exceeded <laughs> oh, any buddy. expectation and become such a good friend. And doing this uh, with me means a lot because these stories, this is exactly why we do this podcast. There are so many people, they hear you at the games, yeah. they have an image of what you do for a living. But getting to know just a little bit about you, I am amazed. The more I learn about you, the more I'm amazed. And I hope people got to learn a lot and here. Brew, that goes two ways. That's a two way street. I feel exactly the same way about you, and you know it. I appreciate it, bro. Oh, appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. All right, listen, this is exactly why we do these podcasts. I say that a lot, but Ron Wolfley is why we do it. That story is amazing, and thanks again, man. Right on, man. That's awesome.